So it appears that we made it. <laughs> or at least some of us did. <laughs> if the rapture happened yesterday, then I guess we all missed it. Nuts. <laughs> but uh, incidentally, Pastor Durr reminded me that <laughs> on Thursday that if we were to have a rapture, that I would not be going. So. <laughs> But it didn't need to be a concern of mine. But the truth is, this is actually serious. Because I got a lot of calls last week from some people in this room even. And they wanted to have urgent pastoral meetings uh, with folks who are especially just anxious about the end of the world predictions coming from a certain serial predictor of such things. You can never know, they reasoned, which is actually fair. And they wanted to talk, however, indirectly about the ways to prepare for the end just in case. Well, predictions do this to and for us. At their best, they help us plan. And at their worst, they imperil us. From terror alerts to the weather, we look at these forecasts for direction to point us somewhere, to give us help, to warn us. Someone once asked me a question that I've never forgotten. He asked, how often do you see a betrayal of the future that casts the time ahead in positive terms? How many movies about the years 2000 something coming posit the world as a place you'd want to live in? How many adaptations of Christianism, and this is a word I've decided to start using as of last week. Uh, it means it's right-wing fundamentalism that selects those who will be able to receive the glory of God as those who are chosen by their leaders, um, and the rest of us can go to hell. Um, anyway, how many adaptations of Christianism would have the entirety of creation, the entirety of creation, not just themselves, looking forward to the times to come? Would they have us look ahead and not feel afraid? Well, not very many. In fact, for me at least, it's quite hard to think of a popular portrayal of the future as anything we'd ever want to see. Within the broad umbrella of Christianity, which includes Christianism, for those who talk most about the future, the image is grim. Unfortunately, those voices seem to have hijacked the future, particularly, particularly when we pay attention to the Gospels and to John in particular and to Jesus specifically. Because if you were listening to today's Gospel, the, a passage that's just so good and so important, it's so good that it's worth committing to memory. Because if you hear what Jesus says, he casts an image of the future, of times to come, and how does he begin? Do not let your hearts be troubled. If you never pay attention to anything else, please pay attention to this. If you have a conversation with a Christianist who wants you to be afraid of your future, Please remind him or her of this. If you read in the paper about all the gloom and the doom that's to come, please, please, please bring those words to mind. Because in one of the most oft-quoted sections of the Bible, John, you know, just a few passages before you'll see that sign held up at a Giants game, Jesus begins, Jesus gives us these words of assurance. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Believe. Believe that a God who would trouble to create would not take delight in destroying. Believe that a God who would give to and past the point of death would not seek our death. Tell me this. Why would a God who would and did destroy death's power then cause death? 
How does that make any sense? Why would God then, why would God undo the work of the re resurrection, re-empowering death? Why would the dem demise of others ever be a celebration? Or let me ask this, why not just listen to Jesus? The one who goes to prepare a place for you, me, them, and all of God's creation. So why not try something countercultural? Why don't we look into the future and actually look forward to going there? Well, this looking forward to the future, it's countercultural because there's control and fear. There's money to be made and minds to bend and hearts to harden in the cultural machinery of fear. And one of the ways to mold us into that control is to point us towards our future and say, be afraid. But friends, never forget that those weren't Jesus' words. Do not let your hearts be troubled, he said. And then, don't forget Jesus' answer to Thomas. Brilliant Thomas. Thomas who I've now begun calling the clarifier. He who asked the questions that if we haven't yet, we should. Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And then remember Jesus' response. Well, we won't know the exact directions. We won't know the contours of a future that hasn't happened yet. But we do know the way. We do know the way because we know the Christ. And Christ is the way. Christ is the way, whether we recognize it or not. The way is still there. Each of us gets a glimpse. A daily moment by moment glimpse of truth life and the way and as we gaze into a universe replete with joy and goodness and grace we glimpse the way at the table we taste the way and yet another glimpse and you see we glimpse the partial delight of the future that is to come a future to which we rightfully look forward all of us as a brilliant theologian put it, as Christians, we see two realities at once, one world as it were within another. One world as we all know it, in all of its beauty and terror, and the other world in its first and ultimate truth, not simply nature, but creation. An endless sea of glory, radiant, with the beauty of God in every part. Jesus' promise in John 14 is a promise to behold and indwell God's radiant and beautiful home, a home in which we already live, though we don't always recognize it. In time, we always will. In time, those two realities become one minus the terror and the exclusion and the hurt and the pain and the control. In time, the glimpse becomes a gaze that becomes all-encompassing, unending, rapturous joy. So don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe. Look to the future and see God. Look to the future and see God, a God who is and always will be, ready to welcome us into it forever and ever. Amen.